Dear friends, uh, dear companions, uh, welcome to this session. Welcome to you here in Paris, uh, joining us for this interesting session. Welcome also to the colleagues that are attending online. This is a blended session, so we have the pressure of having two audiences. Um, it's a pleasure to be with Ajay Kirtan, who is together we will be facilitating the, the session. Let's, let me just start by saying that you have microphones over there and you also have the app to send uh, your comments that will be taken by AJ and will be addressed by, by the whole team. And it's also a pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Peter of Keen, Eber Christensen and Nicholas Van Miggen. Uh, we are going to share with you first the objectives of the session. This is, uh, these are my conflicts of interest. As you know, the, this session has to do with a very special tool for plaque preparation, patients who have uh, calcific stenosis that was developed already years ago. Um, the, this technique, orbital atherectomy, is supported by a large body of scientific evidence that was gathered over the last decade, and it is now used in hundreds of centers uh, all over the world. And um, the interesting thing is that, of course, over this, over this history, orbital atherectomy has gradually been used in more and more complex cases. And this session today actually has to do with the application of orbital atherectomy in these uh, complex uh, coronary subsets. But some, I'm sure that all of you know about the technique. Some of you will be using it in your CAT labs, but it's good also to revisit some of the characteristics. Now, the, one of the uh, key aspects is the guide wire that we use in orbital atherectomy, the Viper wire. Uh, it's, it's, it's an nitinol wire that, as you can see, uh, it's very difficult to to bend or to well to 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 distort, and the navigation is virtually identical to any workhorse wire. This is real time navigating the wire without the need to use a microcatheter um, uh, like we do typically with rotational atherectomy. The system is uh, one of the the the. the the aspects that facilitate its use is that it's an electric system. So you just need to plug it to an electric source that you will see in a second that will make rotate this very special crown. It's a crown that rotates over itself, but also making orbits, and that has an ablation ability both backward and, forward, and forward. So it is there is a possibility of performing backward sanding as well as anti-grade sanding. The system is linked to a special pump, as you can see here, uh, and it is constantly flushed by um, a lubricating solution. So it's, you, you put a lubricant inside this uh, saline bag that makes sure that the whole uh, system is rotating freely. And it has a knob that you can see there that you can use to, adva to, to advance and to bring back the um, um, ablating crown, so to speak. Um, one of the special aspects that it has is that it has a brake, as you can you can you can see there. And once that you 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 need to put the brake to operate the system for ablation, but you can remove it and to go in this particular mode, that is a low velocity speed, to move it uh, in your guiding catheter to reach the coronary arteries. Um, you, the way that you um, set the system on and off is just pressing the button that is there. So it's a very simple, very intuitive tool. Um, we've been using it uh, already, I think that for the last uh, four years. And we can say that, you know, it's, it's a system that is, has particular ability, as you will see also in, 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 in cases that are quite complex. Uh, and this is basically what we wanted to share with you uh, as a sort of um, aperitif for the session. Now, the learning objectives will be to learn how the distinct uh, attributes of orbital atherectomy may help you address challenges, specific challenges of heavily calcific vessels, and also to engage uh, with expert colleagues that are with us today in discussing cases where orbital atherectomy were used in a versatile manner. And we will try to provide also or to obtain from our colleagues valuable tips and tricks that will facilitate the use of orbital atherectomy in your complex uh, PCI cases. So, AJ, I think that with this, uh, probably we can uh, invite uh, the first speaker if you want to, to do so. 
That sounds great. Thank you so much. And also to the audience online, definitely send in your questions. Anyone in the audience here, um, do so. And what we can also do is pose them to the panelists as well as uh, answer them uh, if needed uh, via this way. So with that, uh, the format today will be case presentations with discussion. And so the first presenter is Evald Christensen, needs no introduction, and he's going to be presenting a complex case. So I'll share with you this case, a distal calcified left main trifurcation. Conflict of interest. It's a 82-year-old male with a cabbage 20 years ago, with a lemur to the LED and a venous graft to the right, and a jump vein to the first diagonal and intermediate branch. He now showed up with CCS class 3 angina and a preserved left ventricular function. He had a rubidium pet showing a perfusion defect in the circ and intermediate area. Seven out of 17 segments were hyperperfused. And the angio showed a severe distal left main stenosis, occluded venous graft to the diagonal and intermediate branch, and a patent lemur to the LED. The right coronary had a venous graft with a stenosis. So in this scenario, we don't treat the venous graft. We open the genuine right coronary artery, and the operator opened this right coronary artery, I was guided, and postponed the PCI for the left main. It was staged, so we had the time to think. And I had the patient for this treatment, and I, I thought of I could do some kind of old school treatment. I could do eight friends from femoral, angio guided, and just put in two stents, and maybe be more modern and do rotor shockwave. But I also thought of going radial with seven French, imaging guided, maybe do this with one stent and use a one size fits all orbital. So I think first we should try to understand the distribution of the calcified plaque burden in this distal left main. So drawing a contour of the left main showed me that maybe this tiny channel towards the circ is not the ostial circ. Maybe it's just a part of the left main. And could I do this more simple, ablating the calcium there and avoid stenting the circ? So a cross-section in this region shows a small lumen and a small channel towards the circ. So the strategy in, in looking at this detail analysis, debulk and crack the residual calcification. So this, this procedure, seven French radial imaging guided one stent orbital. So I had difficulties in wiring this intermediate branch, so I had to bring on a microcatheter. I used wire escalation, and I was able to pass the wire into the intermediate branch and exchange for the wiper wire. I did low speed orbital in the intermediate branch and high speed in the left main, because this is the big part I want, the debulking towards the circ. After that, I did the compliance check. I used one indeflator and connected them to two balloons. I could do the compliance check in the intermediate branch and the circ simultaneously. And I could do pre-dilatation with kissing to further be sure that I can get an adequate stent expansion. And this picture is important to see. Please note the, the streak of contrast going into the vessel wall here in the left main and in the intermediate branch indicated, indicating that I have cracks in the calcium. And I also saw that the balloon were expanding adequately, so I had a good uh, compliance in the vessel after orbital arterectomy. So I could easily wire the circ now after orbital. I used a drug eluting balloon in the circ. I used the des drug eluting stand in the intermediate branch and des into the left main. And I used a pot with a 5 0 balloon. So this is after stenting. I could do this with just stenting across the circ. And I had a good expansion of the stent. And um, can tell you that. Procedure time was 92 minutes, contrast used 200 milliliter. So what made the difference in using orbital arterectomy in this case? Wire passage to the circ became easy. I went from two stent to one stent technique, avoided carina shift and ensured stent expansion and it simplified the procedure. 
thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think that uh, AJ, why don't we we, we go and uh, and you elaborate a bit with the help of the interactive screen on on the case by Evold. I think that's a great idea, and you know, keep the questions coming in the meanwhile. But I think to look at this this lesion, it's certainly daunting. I, it's obviously better that the LED is grafted, but for many operators, they'll look at this, and the biggest concerns are: Are you going to lose branches or not? Um, and the plaque distribution, which you so nicely illustrated, you know, right here at the carina, there's often a feeling that if you do atherectomy or do anything, that you could lose the other branch. And there's certainly other technologies out there that are being advertised to sort of be protective of the branches. But the reality is when you have this much plaque, even technologies that crack the calcium in that area can be somewhat unpredictable. And I think it therefore makes sense to debulk because the idea of the strategy was to basically debulk in this direction to then facilitate everything else. And so I think when we look at these, th that strategy has been tried and true. It's very rare. And maybe we should ask the panel, Peter or Nicholas, you know, when you do atherectomy, are you worried about losing side branches or more often than not, are you getting debulking to then improve access like you've all demonstrated? Well, that's a great question. It's a fantastic case. I mean, Evolve has made this really complex case appear very simple. In answer to your question, I think atherectomy, I think, preserves side branches. If, if anything, I think it's much more effective than balloons. So I'm never worried about losing side branches if I'm doing atherectomy. Yeah, Nicholas, same? same? Okay. Yeah, more or less the same. And obviously, you typically don't have a safety wire as, as you're doing atherectomy. So I think for the audience, that's important to realize that you give up a safety wire in your side branch in principle when you proceed with an atherectomy. The question evolved for you um, is that you said you had some difficulty wiring. Are you predominantly using primary wiring with the flex tip Viper wire or, or a lesion like this? Is that, That's going to be virtually impossible because right? a lot of people feel that it's pretty safe to do. Yeah, when I can see a channel uh, and uh, it's predictable that I will get down a wire directly with the Viper wire. And I think it's a good wire. It has a good performance. It has very good tip control. So wiring directly is uh, easy. But in this case, where I had to use wire escalation, I have the microcatheter for doing the wire exchange afterwards. But uh, often I try to wire directly. And any thoughts about protecting? There are these strategies you'll see on social media where you can put a microcatheter in and ablate the other branch. Uh, so I know, Nicholas, you're smiling. Maybe, Javier, any thoughts? Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought to try it or no? Well, obviously, it is tempting to. And the reason what you want to do is then you put a safety wire in your side branch and then you use a, a, micro, a guide liner um, across the the main branch into the the the, the branch that you want to do that you want to treat with atherectomy and then by having that guideliner you protect that side branch wire i've never used it uh, I, to be honest it complicates the procedure and as peter already alluded to the risk of losing the side branch with atherectomy is is minimal i think but it's possible it's possible in, that, in, in my experience i've done it with a rotational atherectomy <laughs> But here we are talking of a device that has a much more powerful ablation uh, power and that orbits on itself. And personally, I, I will be concerned, you know, that at the difference with rotational atherectomy, the orbits of my, uh, of my work may damage the microcatheter. So that's, that's something that... Yeah, it's been concern. published, but I, I don't think there's a need in general because you don't lose a side branch. And I think one of the elegant points that you... That left and right juxtaposition of eight French, you know, do it old school versus, you know, doing this radially elegantly with a low profile device that you can use both low and high speed is, is a pretty uh, compelling argument for doing it the way you did it. Yeah. I have a question regarding the compliance test with two balloons, one yeah. in deflator. I think it was a very interesting uh, tip and trick, but perhaps you can elaborate a bit uh, on uh, you do it and perhaps yeah. if, if you wish to use the screen. Uh, later. Yeah, uh, maybe I cannot show it on the screen. I think I can explain it. We have a three-way connector and we have additional connections so we connect two balloons to one end deflator and we think it's very important also when you do the final kiss in bifurcation because you don't have the carina shift they deflate exactly at the same time you often see operators say up one two three down okay. yeah you can do it on your own sure. and you can pre dilate as we did here two vessels at the same time Another thing I think we sometimes miss is the pre-dilatation with kissing balloon because when we dilate with balloons in one branch, the balloon tends to 
bulge away from the calcium sitting opposite to the side branch takeoff. So having the balloon in a side branch gives a much more support or much more pressure towards the calcium sitting opposite. So predilating with uh, kissing balloon after calcium modification is something that works together. Sometimes if it does not work, we have to add on, for instance, IVL. But here, the, the kissing balloon did the job. Yeah, I would definitely say that um, after any technology, you know, for me, whether it's this, IVL, Rota, always go up with NC balloons to make sure that you've effectively gotten the crack. Um, there was a question about using imaging to determine the strategy. I think at present, this is a challenging lesion to get an imaging catheter across without doing something up front. So my feeling on a case like this is you're either going to go first with a balloon-based approach, um, which could have its own issues, or do it this way where you get through with the atherosclerosis device, wire the side branch, dilate everything, ensure you have a crack, and then proceed at the end. Any, any questions with, from the colleagues? Uh, you... Yeah, so the two questions were intravascular imaging were the, were the questions, and then one was re uh, stenosis risk of a drug-eluting balloon after debulking with atherectomy. So I was saving that one to ask you all because oh, we don't have them. I, I wish I had the answer. I think we need more evidence for that. But on the other hand, we know that when you can do a bifurcation with one stent technique, it seems to have a very good prognosis compared to two-stent technique. On the other hand, two-stent techniques are more deceased vessels up front. So we should have more um, evidence for uh, doing things simple in the side branch with a drug eluting balloon. If the patient has symptoms, re stenosis, we can do uh, convert to a culotte later. So. I, th I think also Bernard Chevalier yesterday also uh, reported on the, the KISS study and quite compelling a minimum um, how do you call it, minimize, a minimalistic approach mm -hmm. does work in, uh, in, in bifurcation. So I, I kind of like it. But just coming back to that technique, so you use one in deflator. Is that your default technique these days? One in deflator yeah. connected to the stopcock and then two balloons. Yes. I'm going to try yes. that yeah. too. You, you, can, you can buy this small uh, extra device to put on the three-way three uh, uh, connector and then connect two. Yeah. It's quite simple. We got some great questions coming in. So this is awesome audience engagement, both off and on site. And um, typically in terms of how you decide when to stop the runs is an auditory phenomenon and you can hear the pitch change. If that's the case, you tend to keep going slowly through the lesion. Um, and then as far as the mechanism of action and effectiveness, you're basically getting both cracks as well as debulking itself. But the key issue here in terms of stent expansion relates largely to the cracks. So that's, I think, a key mechanism that's needed to happen. Um, final question is that need to predilate in order to pass this catheter. That's actually a good question to everybody. I, my feeling on this is that it, there initially folks felt that because there's no front cutting burr, that this would not cross. But because it spins, it actually crosses a lot more frequently. So a lesion like this, you would not need to predilate mm. typically. Not, you didn't have to, right? No, the microcatheter passes, and then I think the device also passes. I think that in, in all atherectomy techniques, if it is possible to go primarily with the burr, and not predilating is important. And probably, again, in, in this technique that really has an effect on deep medial calcium, etc., if you can avoid having uh, flaps or the sections caused by balloon dilation, the better. I think and, that's, uh, and then uh, this technology is relatively contraindicated, right? You don't want to interact too much with uh, significant dissections. <laughs> so with a rotoblator, I would... Uh, I, I do it sometimes, but with, with this technology, I, I prefer to go directly with, uh, with the orbital. Yeah. One more last question from my end. Um, you didn't use imaging at all. You are an imager. You do, you do quite some imaging. I would have ended up with some kind of imaging just to make sure that this complicated lesion would be treated for the ages. Yeah, I think I was so happy when I saw this result, I completely <laughs> forgot I, to pass that. I got it. That's, that's a human <laughs> reaction. Just, just to, well, <laughs> yeah, he I did put on the right of the slide yeah, yeah, imaging. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that up front. Yeah, yeah. When I saw the cracks, when I saw the stent expansion, yeah. and I used um, uh, the time for this, uh, I, I did. But I think you it's should. Human. You, it's left main. Check it with imaging. Yeah, sure. it's always I best agree. when yeah, the presenter beats himself up as opposed to the rest of us. So that's great. Well, well done. And uh, let's move on to the next uh, next uh, case presentations. So Peter. Yes. Yeah, so Peter, uh, Peter O'Keen, thank you for being with us. And um, let's have a look. I think that your case is going also to have the, give us the opportunity to see again the principles and the use of atherectomy in place. Isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, a very esteemed panel. 
Um, so I think my case will be interesting. My conflict that's not on here is that we've only had Orbital in our center for about 18 months. So we're relatively new to this. But actually, even having had it for a short period of time, we've maybe done 15, 16 cases, we're already in the position where it's really straightforward to use and, and we can train with it. And this is an interesting case coming up. So in, enjoy some of the comedy, a little bit of video. This is a 72-year-old uh, patient um, who's kindly agreed to go into a trial, you'll see shortly. He's got quite bad angina um, and he's had previous uh, stroke back in 2000. And that's his angiogram. I think you can see there's a, a lesion in the LAD. Left ventricular function is normal. He had a CT for his chest because he had asthma and that pricked up the coronary calcification. Now he's agreed to go into Define GPS trial, which is a really interesting trial. <laughs> We've got three operators in this case and one of my colleagues from Worcester, my friend and colleague Helen Routledge is going to be doing this case and my uh, fellow Jonathan Hinton. So this patient is randomized to pressure wire guidance. So we do an omniwire delivery and you can see the IFR highly significant 0.12. There is the uh, sync vision pullback, and you can see all the dots around that lesion that we saw on the angiogram. And that we do a stent planner initially to work out what's going on. And as Jonathan was pulling back that wire, you can see the guide was getting sucked in. This was tight. And going back to your question earlier, I did take a balloon here just to kind of create a little bit of space. Now, also, you know, we're a fiscally aware plan, so, you know, we want to make sure that we don't have to use devices without it. But this is clearly a case for Orbital. I chose Orbital because I wanted to show Helen how to, how to do it, and Helen was going to do her first case with me. So this is us setting up. We're obviously, we work very fast in Bournemouth. It's a really, uh, our life staff are highly motivated. But this is, it is actually pretty quick to set up. You know, we've even been relatively newbies to it. It's ready to go in about five minutes, so it's pretty quick. So we do deliver over a microcatheter here, but the Viper wire, as has been said, is a really cool wire compared to rotor wire, I think. It's much easier. Um, and then we do a trap balloon, we take out the microcatheter, and then this is the uh, crown, as Javier has already alluded to. So it's just like, you know, with any sort of advancer, you just move the, uh, the, the knob of the advancer forward and that pushes the device out. Two speeds, you saw there, 80 and uh, 120. And then glide assist is, is sort of, um, and the way that it's spinning around at very low speed that you use to deliver the crown. So we're delivering the crown, standard technique. The Viper wire is a little bit more slippery than a rotor wire, so it can come back a bit. So we've got the crown in situ. And what's really interesting throughout this case is how stable that patient is. There's no ECG changes. It's a very tight lesion. And this device went into the lesion and we could just sit there and we could go very slowly. And you see how slowly Jonathan's moving uh, the crown back and forth really, really gently. Um, so it's a sort of, and it, you know, there isn't much tactile feedback. You get a bit of vibration. Now I'm moving my head nearer, not to not to look inside the machine, <laughs> but just to give you the audio comment. So this is the this is the uh, crown spinning. This is at low speed. So when you're at, when you're in an area of ablation, you get this subtle sound change, and that's where you want to hang out. You want to sort of leave it there and go a little bit longer in that space. So that's what I'm doing there. I know it looks a bit weird. Yeah. It's not mandatory, right? No, you know, you, know, you, you don't, <laughs> don't do it with a headset every time, no. I think it So, you know, this is Helen's first case, and, you know, she's finding it pretty comfortable. We're able to inject around the crown. So you get 30 seconds of ablation, then you hear a beep, you stop. And Helen says to me, we've stopped inside the lesion. That's not really intuitive for us. We don't normally do that. But with this device, it's bi-directional. So you can do that. So I think it's a bit safer. I think burr entrapment or crown entrapment is probably less of an issue. But, you know, I, I'm a novice. So once we've done that, we're happy we've done enough. We then uh, use glide assist to remove the crown. And I think this is where, you know, for me, imaging is key. So we're going to try and understand this artery in more detail. We're going to do OCT. And this is uh, manual pullback. It's, it's far, speeded up, but this is what we're doing at the time. So we do a, a distal reference diameter, get that measurement, EEL. You see the burden of calcium as I pull back. Lots of areas of eccentric calcium. The thickness up to a millimeter. So the question is, have we done enough? We see that there are some fractures. We're now doing a proximal reference diameter. So OCT has given us all that information. We don't have to guess. We know what's going on. And this is where, where we're at. This is a still. And you can see the calcium is there, quite thick, fracture there. And over that length of uh, sort of vessel, over that really severe stenosis, we still see a high burden of calcium. Now, going back to any algorithm, this is um, uh, an algorithm uh, that I've picked out from the journal which I'm involved with. It's a really cool algorithm. 
but it points us in the direction of shockwave because we need something else to help debulk this lesion. We're not ready to put a device in at this stage, particularly in a clinical trial where we're trying to get perfect results. So this is a 3512 IVL, and we use the clear stent imaging, as, as you saw a second ago, to try and position the electrodes, get maximal gain, get the best pulse management. And we've got the OCT up as well with the, with the um, uh, co-registration, so we kind of know where we are. So this is uh, us delivering all the pulses, and this is the C2 Plus balloon, so we've got 120 pulses. Gives us a bit more uh, flexibility, I guess. And then once we're at the point where we feel we've got enough uh, balloon dilatation, we're then going to switch out for a non-compliant balloon, which is that. And you can see 3520, I think it is, and it, you know it's reasonably well expanded. But we're not going to stop at this point. We're not going to put a stent in until we've demonstrated uh, good efficacy with OCT. We want to make sure that we're ready to um, put a stent in. And in fact, what's interesting, again, the OCT, she might change your mind a little bit on the landing zone. We've gone a little bit more distal. It looks a bit more normal there. And then we, we pull ourselves back. We see a lot more disruption. There's still some nodular calcification. I think, you know, we can't get rid of that completely. But we definitely have better luminal gain. We have more ability, I think, to be able to expand the stent. So it gives us the right length of stent. So it's a 3548. It's exactly normal to normal. Stent expands, we go up for longer periods of time with our stents, particularly when they're long, to make sure it's properly delivered. 4-0 pot, we actually do rewire this diagonal. You know, we talked about the side branch, probably didn't need to, it's not a very big side branch in the grand scheme, but we do rewire it. Um, and now we're gonna um, do our post dilatation. We're taking a 3-5 balloon uh, distal. And as you saw, we did the pot, we take out the gelled wire, and then we go back to OCT and do our third run. We don't take too many angiogram pictures, so we don't waste contrast. We save it for the OCT. OCT then uh, comes about. We see then we've got no distal edge problem. Just check we haven't got an edge dissection. Looks very clean. We spin around a little bit. We look for expansion index. And we're looking at around 80% expansion, which I think in this case is probably adequate. Um, if we go uh, try to go above that, we may end up with a complication. We use the Bifurcation 3D software. This is the Aptiview software, which we still have rather than Ultrion. And we can see that this, this diagonal looks fine. There's no need to do any kissing. Uh, you know, if anything, we're probably going to do more harm. Then, of course, we have to check the physiology um, and we make sure, and we get an IFR of 0.93. We're happy with that. We do our pullback. Um, and, uh, and Helen actually comments that you know, we haven't lost any of the septals, which, again, I think is, is nice because sometimes when you deal with these complex lesions, you can lose uh, small branches. So that's our sort of final angiographic result. But of course, that's us in the lab. We've enjoyed ourselves. We've had a nice time. The patient's been very comfortable. Um, but then, of course, the work has to be sent off to the core lab uh, to get our homework marked. And this is always a scary bit when a Kiko Mihira uh, comes back and tells you whether you've done a good case or a bad case. And you get a nice summary of the angiographic data, the physiology data, the imaging data pre, peri, and post uh, stenting. And then you get a final sheet that tells you, have you done enough? And we did all right, but it was only acceptable. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm going to conclude with my conclusions. I think orbital atherectomy, I've been, always wanted to get it and uh, looked at it for years and it was so glad it came to the UK. We can use it easily. We can teach with it pretty easily. It's a really nice device. I think when you've got a lot of calcium, particularly when it's thick, and, and particularly uh, eccentric, you have to think about two, oper uh, two different devices. Maybe a more experienced uh, orbital operator would have stuck, gone back with orbital and done more high speed, I don't know. Something to discuss. If you're gonna do imaging, do it properly, do it pre, during and afterwards. Um, I don't think you could use the IVL on its own here because you wouldn't have delivered it. You saw how tight the lesion was, so you definitely need atherectomy. Um, and we didn't have any complications, uh, which was great. And the troponin was okay because we checked that within the trial. Um, and that's my sort of summary slide of why I thought atherectomy in this case was cool. It's safe, simple, and effective. It modifies the calcium, even in severe lesions. Um, and I think it, in this case, it facilitated a really nice preparation and gave us a great result uh, with normalization of the IFR. And the patient, I've seen him recently, and he's really, really well with no symptoms. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. This was fantastic. Um, we have uh, time for two questions, just to keep in time. So let's go for them. Yeah, so first, uh, online says congratulations. Thank so you. That's great. Um, I think the biggest questions were about the high speed and low speed that came in online. Um, I can say 
personally, I wouldn't have done high speed, actually. I would have just done low and gone with an NC balloon. And the interesting thing is when you observe fractures like the one that um, you showed, I, I personally think it's an open question as to whether you actually need to do IVL versus just dilate with an NC because really once you have the fracture, you've disarticulated the calcium and that might be sufficient. So I, it's worth studying because from an economic argument, you could certainly make the argument not to use it. Um, but I think that was the question. So what vessels are you using high speed in? So I never, I've so far never used it. I think we have a, quite a significant experience with orbital heterectomy in, in Rotterdam. I've, I've never used it because I, I still haven't identified the pro and cons uh, of high speed uh, orbital heterectomy. So maybe uh, you guys enlighten me. I think something that could be interesting is I, I was very impressed by the, fracks, the cracks that you were causing uh, mm -hmm. with the device. Uh, AJ, you want to elaborate a bit on the mechanism of action of, of, of orbital effects, I mean that. Yeah, I mean, so this is the picture that Peter you showed in the intro video and, and, and the intro slide, and everybody can appreciate with OCT how well delineated and demarcated the calcium is with an ability to actually measure the distance. But this type of fracture, as I said, disarticulation, is a deep wall fracture, and that will allow you to expand your stent. It was interesting. That was just after the OAS alone. Typically, you see this after OAS with a balloon, yeah. an NC balloon. And um, I think this is... This element of deep fracture will allow you to expand the stent. For me personally, the, the high speed, I'll use it in very straight segments. Um, left main is one area where I might, or a very straight segment of the right, but otherwise um, tend to not use it. And you don't generally have to um, otherwise. Do the hemodynamic perturbations um, evolve? Has that been your experience as well that in terms of stability and ST changes and pacemaker need yeah, yeah. and all that? I think it's really a, a balance between what the gain is by doing high speed and the rip. Sometimes we, if you are too aggressive, you will see ECD changes and the patient feels something. So big vessels, left main, big right, no no angulation. Because I also have the impression that if you have a perforation, high speed in angulated areas could be some concern. So I would like, you can bring it in again, you can test the compliance. It's difficult to go and take the high speed away if you have already done it. So you can do a dose response you can do the low speed, check the compliance, and then see if you are done. Or add IVL. That, that's, uh, yeah. of course, the question what you should do. And I thought the high speed in this vessel was safe because it was quite a big diameter artery, and I thought it was quite you know, straight. straight. But I agree with you. I take everything on board. And, and this is it's nice to learn. I learn from experts. We've done lots. Fantastic. So let's uh, continue. And now uh, we have uh, Nicholas Van Migging with us uh, from the Thorax Center. Uh, and we are going to, to see another very interesting complex PCI case handled with orbital hysterectomy. Thank you very much, Javier, uh, a Thorax Center alumni, if I may Absolutely, say. I'm an alumni of Thorax Center, so yes. it's always, always great to have a colleague. <laughs> yes, so here we go. So um, I'm going to discuss a high-risk PCI that we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, I do collaborate with industry. And this is the patient that we're treating. Uh, it's an 83-year-old male um, with symptoms, with stable symptoms of angina, but also progressive shortness of breath. Uh, you can see his medical history. It includes diabetes, chronic kidney uh, disease. Um, he has uh, all the medical treatment that he uh, required per his referring cardiologist. And they did an angio in the referring hospital and the diagnosis was made of two vessel disease. And we'll get to that uh, later. He also had a depressed LV function. Now, just based on this uh, scheme, uh, the patient was discussed in the heart team and um, the suggestion was made uh, to uh, proceed with um, cabbage. However, the patient categorically declined. He did not want to be operated on. This is his echo. So I think you can uh, agree with me that, I hope you can agree with me that this is a depressed LV function. Um, and let's move now to the uh, angios that we made. And obviously, as you can tell, uh, we were a little bit concerned with the combination of LV dysfunction and the quite significant disease in the left main extending into the LAD. We're talking about disease from the ostium of the left main and it's, I think, best uh, appreciable uh, in the, whoops, how does this work? Uh, here, in the uh, cranial view, you see it in the middle LED, but also if you move to the left main just before the bifurcation and look at that ugly ostium, 
uh, with also a pressure loss upon a cannulation of uh, the left main in the referring hospital. So we started the case with uh, implanting the Impella CP and then we got these pictures. Um, we were also planning to treat the circumflex, uh, not we would stay away from the bifurcation, the distal left main bifurcation, because we thought it was a Medina 110. And then obviously um, IVUS uh, or imaging guidance. Because of the poor kidney function, we, we uh, elected for an IVUS evaluation. And if we slowly pull back from the left main, from the LED into the left main, basically what you see nodular calcium, you see a very calcific disease over a long segment. And then as we enter the left main, there is a significant stenosis that is also repeated at the ostium of the left main. So um, disease at the bifurcation, sorry, but but also at the ostium of the left main, and then also a combination of nodular and extensive circular calcium uh, along the LAD. So this is uh, summarized. Here we have uh, several experts in the thorax center to do all the interpretation of the uh, intervascular imaging that we're performing. So I was quite confident that this is some disease that requires more attention than just ballooning. Uh, and this is basically summarized here. So we have the ostium MLA, ostium left main of two millimeters square. Then there is the MLA and the LED of 1.86. And you can also appreciate the calcified nodule there. So this is why, uh, this is a typical lesion where I would prefer orbital atherectomy. Several reasons, but also obviously the ease of use. The patient, uh, we wired the lesion with the Viper wire. So that was definitely possible. So no exchange uh, of a regular wire and a an, uh, micro catheter. And then uh, we went in with our orbital atherectomy. So the, the key is here to go slow and um, as, you, as we mentioned, there is an osteo left main disease. So I'm a little bit concerned with osteo left mains if I need to do, do rotablation. Somehow I feel that there is a higher risk for uh, embolization and, and neurological events. So what I did in this case, I keep the, the guiding catheter into the osteum of the left main, get that uh, orbital atherectomy with glide assist into the into the LAD and then I started with pulling back because this bidirectional treatment obviously and that is a major advantage of orbital atherectomy and quite unique to this kind of uh, technology. It was uh, very, it was basically hemodynamically perfectly stable, the procedure itself, uneventful, uh, obviously also because we anticipated uh, some issues by using the, the Impella system and after at the orbital atherectomy, we did another uh, OC, uh, IVUS run. And basically, this goes a little bit fast, uh, this pullback, but uh, we definitely um, worked our way through the calcium. This is the illustrations of what happened to the calcified nodule. It really got destroyed just by doing orbital atherectomy. And the thick calcium also was modified uh, with um, our diamond bag. Um, obviously, we always follow, as uh, RJ already uh, alluded to, uh, orbital atherectomy with a one-to-one -one sized non-compliant balloon. And if that expands properly, that will be then uh, good enough for a stent to expand. If we would see under expansion of the, of the non-compliant balloon, then our IVL would be our next step. So we, are, we try to be also economically responsible in that regard. Uh, so a non-compliant balloon then. And this is our final result. So we, we treated the circumflex, but not all the way to the, the bifurcation of the left main. And then the bifurcation looks very nice. Uh, the left main looks nice all the way to the ostium. Obviously, AVOLT would stop now, but uh, in Rotterdam, we typically would uh, continue with, uh, <laughs> with an IVIS. We try to be disciplined. And uh, this is the, basically the pullback uh, in the left main, where you see that uh, we have a nice expansion of the stand along the left main with a little bit protrusion into um, the, the aorta, but I think that was mandatory because we had the extensive disease all the way right at the ostium of the left main. So my takeaway slide would be uh, this. In this particular case, uh, with extensive calcific left main and LAD disease, um, 
including osteum left main, more than 50 millimeters of calcium, circular calcium, and also including a nodule. Uh, I would prefer the diamond back. Um, orbital aterectomy, why? Because there is a double effect. There is this bidirectional differential sending, so you can go back and forth and uh, provide therapy. But at the same time, we also saw in the previous case that um, you also affect the deeper calcium, and that is the pulsatile forces that are also being generated by uh, the device. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you. You want to stay with us uh, here in the podium? Just in case that. So, some questions definitely coming in from the audience. So, do, do you do the NC balloon compliance check on the Viper wire? Do you swap out? What do you typically do? And, uh, um, most of the time, I will. Um, you can do it over the Viper wire, but obviously, it's a long wire. It's a three meter wire. It adds a little bit of complexity. I'm used to working with long wires, but typically after orbital, I would exchange uh, f uh, over a micro catheter uh, because I want to be sure that I don't get stuck with a new wire in a dis dissection flap, but I exchange. With, uh, most of the time, I, by the way, I use an over-the-wire balloon to be economically, again, responsible. So a 125 over-the-wire balloon exchange, and then my go-to wire is a balanced heavyweight wire just to get some extra support. The other thing you can also do is if you want to put a second wire down, a workhorse wire, free wire, balloon over that short wire and you get good expansion, then you can remove your Viper. Or if you don't, then you can certainly take that out and then do another run or other runs if needed. So a question from the audience. Thank you. Um, just a question about um, angulation. Uh, fantastic cases. Thank you. Um, if you've got a very angulated circumflex, for example, um, that's one limitation of rotor. You worry that you may perforate or um, uh, have the stuck rotor. How does this traverse sort of angulated calcific lesions? So my, my personal experience is quite favorable. And I think the, the technique of using this um, device is very important in that regard. You really have to go very slow and take your time as you are approaching the tortuous segment. And by doing so, the device will follow the tortuosity. And I have the impression that um, the risk for perforations with this device seems to be a little bit less than with um, or a rotational atherectomy, but there is also more wire bias, obviously. Yeah, I think that, 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 that's a very important point. I think that particularly, and it would be great to know your, your feeling about this, but the, the osteocircumflex in particular, I think, is one a great indication for orbital atherectomy. The reason for that is because, as we know, the atheroma will never be in the corina, but it will be, obviously, in the, so to speak, uh, inner curvature of the origin of the circumflex. And typically, you may have nodules or whatever, and, uh, and when you're using rotational atherectomy, you will never ablate that particular. The board will try to go in the outer curvature of the circumflex. Uh, the great thing of performing backward sanding is that when you bring back your rotating orbital atherectomy, it will ablate selectively yeah. the inner curvature. And I think that this is one of the most uh, safe, specific scenarios for me for orbital atherectomy. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. I think this is, it really separates itself from rotational atherectomy. It's not one to one comparable. So I agree with, uh, with your explanation. And also, before, in the same direction, the way that you operate it is quite different. I, I love the video where, you know, the, the, the operator was moving the ball so, so slowly that it looked like you went <laughs> to check if he really was moving his fingers or not. But I never yeah. do that like that. that <laughs> I <know>. I <laughs> this, I'll this, clarify. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah it was, it was, and that was only just to get the sound. But yeah, you, I mean, you're right. The movement is entirely... Tiny. It's, it's virtually imperceptible, isn't it? It's really, really small movement. So let's let's see. Ajay is going to elaborate a bit on the nodule and yeah. Uh, yeah and I think the other part that I would ma mention about good atherectomy technique in general is that um, I always caution, especially newer users um, of any atherectomy device, is to take a cine angiogram after you have the wire down. This wire, the flex tip wire, is actually much f more flexible than conventional wires, and there's another wire version that's more stiff. But the issue is, is that um, I'll just draw it over here is that let's say you are talking about an osteal cirque and let's say that the angulation is like this okay and and it's super angulated like that no atherectomy device is going to be an ideal uh, situation for something like that and what often happens when you put the wire down instead of it being angulated like that 
you see the wire going like this and the vessel is straightened to this direction. That's a problem. You don't want to do atherectomy in those types of circumstances. So just be cognizant of that as you go forward. I think one of the advantages of this specific device though, is that in this case, as Nicholas showed you, there was a calcified nodule. There was an ostium in the left main, which tends to be a bigger vessel. There's an LED lesion. And with a single device, you could effectively treat all three. Um, and that's very unique about having a device um, like this. One question, Nicholas, I'll ask you though, is that in, in, you know, at least for many people, there's less hemodynamic perturbation with this device, partly because it's one five, partly because the flow rate is high. Um, the use of the hemodynamic support, was that something that you'd talked about or do you need to use it less frequently with this device, more frequently? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I must say that the reason why I would use it is because it's very important to go slow, right? You, you advance the system one millimeter per second in principle. That's the, the rule of thumb. So that means I'm talking about a 50 um, millimeter um, calcified lesion. So I would need quite some time to get, to get my way through that uh, lesion. And obviously you would expect less of distal embolization as compared to rotational atherectomy, but it's not zero. And, um, you know, depressed LV function, also our experience with um, mechanical circulatory support. So in, in our hands and in obviously uh, safe uh, peripheral access, uh, I think this is, um, this is a worthwhile su additional supportive measure. Extremely important. I think that we all have seen uh, the, the, the cases like this, that when we go with uh, atherectomy, then the pulsatility goes down. And you can imagine, and, and, and the patient is supported by mechanical support, secretary support, and you can, you, you figure out what will, might happen if you will be doing it without uh, that uh, support. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, I will say that um, at least when we've looked at the hemodynamics of uh, various atherectomy devices in a randomized way, there does appear to be less transient stuff going on downstream and we we actually measured microvascular um you know function that way uh with with this device than with rota for instance um but again if you're going to do this case without support and when someone from the audience asked it's a single stent bifurcation strategy was in pill indicated if you're going to do it without it then for sure get a right heart cath and assess the hemodynamics up front because if the patient is decompensated, long runs of any atherectomy device, it's only going to get worse. And every patient, when we do PCI, they get sicker before they get healthier. And people with low uh, depressed ventricular function just have less reserve to deal with that. Yeah, um, on top of that, I think your mindset is totally different once the mechanical support is in place, right? You you can really then focus on getting the, the optimal t treatment result. If you have, you know, as unstable hemodynamics, you may want to rush and then your final result is not going to be the optimal result with potentially um, less good longer term results. As you know, I like to spare the money. So one way to do this is to put a pigtail into the left ventricle from the groin, measure the pressure, and it takes very short time to deliver the impeller wire and deliver the impeller. In the so when we have this, we don't want surprises. We know the anatomy in the groin, in the iliac artery, and one way is put a pigtail in the left ventricle, and if there's any sign of deterioration, you can do it. So, you, Because you, there is a prize to have a big sheath in the groin also, so we have to always figure out the balance. I mean, speaking about the patient, you know, um, we have to remember that there was uh, also impaired kidney function. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the, the creatinine clues were something less 37, 30. yeah. Yeah. So, it, I, personally, I believe that in these patients, to play safe, uh, keeping good hemodynamics is very important. Mm, yeah. Also for the kidney. I mean, you, you do not want to have full... Uh, I think that there are studies in Germany that have demonstrated, you know, that in patients like this, Keeping the uh, hemodynamics with mechanical circulatory support is so is very important. So overall, I think that is the type of patient that we really would like to you know be on the safe side and to perform the intervention comfortably and and safer from from a hemodynamic standpoint. Yeah. And we'll see in Protect Four because it's certainly randomizing and there's a kidney sub study. Maybe Peter, there's a question from the audience. Um, oh. Limits of the device uh, with uncrossable lesions. So <clears throat> is that uncrossable maybe through CTOs? in the subintimal space, is that still a space for rota, um, or can you use this device in those spaces? I haven't used it in the subintimal space, but I mean, I, we've certainly 
the cases we've picked have been pretty challenging. And uh, I think all but one was one we, we couldn't cross. And in fact, that case, we couldn't cross with Rota either. And we, in the end, it sort of ends up with this situation where you got guideliner halfway down the vessel to try and get a tiny balloon. So I found it actually pretty, it works well. It is, I was surprised at how good it is at crossing lesions. <laughs> I um, think that's the... That is amazing. That, the general experience is that it crosses more than you expect it to. Uh, also, you can put it through a six French guide extension, which is nice. Um, but I will say that there are definitely uncrossable lesions where you, where you need rotoblader, um, and certainly in the subintimal space. And the other one is if you're going to do stent ablation, um, I, I personally would not use this device. I, uh, this is all completely off-label, of course. Um, but, you know, those are big burrs, big burrs with rotoblader if you're going to do it that way. Any other questions from the audience? We Lots of compliments about the cases, though. Brilliant result, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm leaving this <laughs> So I think that you know the probably in terms of um, providing some f uh, final messages, and, and I, I would like very much, Peter, that you were showing us how to proctor um, a, a young colleague on this. Could you deliver some messages to the um, to the, the colleagues, the physicians, who have already experienced in a rotational atherectomy, and now they want to transition to use orbital? Uh, are there any false friends? Are there, are there any sort of habits do you know that are valid for rotational atherectomy that perhaps are not applicable or useful? Uh, a, a, it's a good question, and I think for, for me, it's uh, firstly it's about the team approach. So I think the first thing is to get the catheter lab team up to speed because you know our cath lab team were so used to using rotor, they they thought, oh, God, you're not a new device to learn, you know. But but once they once they saw it, once they understood it, it was pretty similar in the setup. Uh, same type of concept actually they they now like it and some of them prefer it so it didn't take very long so but they're getting them on board early so we we spent time video in the setup and getting some of the uh, uh, industry colleagues to come in and help and and now it's just like you know that's i think a key thing because like any device if it's a barrier to use it if your team don't want to use it then you won't use it so get everyone on board in terms of the Similar technique to rotor, isn't it? In the sense that you've got to get a wire down. You may do that independently. You may do it with a micro catheter. So that's very similar. Then the advancer is very similar. And actually, it's more akin to rotor pro than perhaps the previous iteration of rotor being sort of more electrical. So I think it's so similar and I think it's so simple to use that for me, it's an easy transition and it's really easy to teach and better uh, to teach perhaps than rotor because it's safer. It just feels safer. The patient doesn't seem to get the same type of issues. Nicholas, in, in, to your fellows and to the people that you proctor, any additional, say, messages on top of these? Well, I think what they will experience is that the setup is even faster than with uh, Rota. And uh, I also, you know, I always tell them, listen, Rota, Blade, Rota Blader hasn't changed a lot since 1987, and that's way before my time. But um, I think I think um, Orbital Atherectomy is, is more a device of the two th of the year 2020 20s than than rota ablation. So it's it's smoother, it's slicker, um, and there is a one size fits all. Sure. So it's also uh, I think that also is an advantage. And obviously the cases illustrated today that um, you can really um, tackle very challenging uh, disease that may not be perfect candidates for rot ablation either. So I think it's definitely a worthwhile addition to our armamentarium and it's easy to proctor as, as Peter uh, illustrated. The biggest difference though, I mean, in terms of technique though, most people with rota are used to the, the pecking yeah. the back and forth and this is much more gradual, gentle forward. I think that's probably the biggest difference um, for me also. It's just anticipating hemodynamic perturbations. If you're going to do three vessel rota of all vessels, you got to have some backup plan for hemodynamic support because there's going to be stunning. Whereas I think this tends to be more forgiving with regards to that. I mean, something is true also that because you have the possibility of backward sanding, the chances of getting device entrapment are lower than with a rotational atherectomy. Don't you think so? And that's also something important because you sometimes you may park your um, your uh, ground distal to the the stenosis and then being able to send it back. I think the ease of also delivering the wire, it's easier to wire directly with this one. And also in the scenario where you have wired the vessel with maybe a CTO wire, you cannot get a microcatheter balloon through and you say, okay, I try to put a microcatheter down and hope for the best that I can deliver the rotor wire. Drilling this wire through this circular calcium 
is uh, it's more deliverable, both in the scenario where you ride directly and also in the, this situation where you cannot pass balloon and microcatheters. And then also the one size fits all. You don't have to step up in bursa size. Yeah. So, uh, I think, I think a, and the one the final point though is, is that it, based on what we're saying, it all sounds great and easy, but good good technique involves making sure that you account for wire bias even with a flexible wire. And so, um, you know, clearly that's where I've seen people get into trouble is that there's just uh, too much wire straightening or something like that. And if you don't perforate, you may get a very deep cut that then can lead to, you know, other problems later. So just as long as you're cognizant of that, like, you know, any, anything, it's just great to have more tools. That's the most important. Part. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. So let's say, um, I don't know if there are any additional questions Jane, that we have to, to address. One last one that just yeah. came in, um, any benefits of OA instead of shockwave. So that, that's a question that does often come up what do, what do people think well i think i think this is technology that uh, that can avoid the need for shockwave because it also may interact there are some indications that it also interacts with the deeper calcium so um i don't i would not say that it is better than i think all these devices are complementary I think it's a question of the distribution of the calcium. If it's a nodular calcium or thick calcium in one side, I know that some say that shockwave can do the cracks, but um, in my hands it's not always modifying that. So the, the circular calcium where the energy is kept in the calcium shockwave is of course very nice. Calcium on one side in big vessels where you want to debug. That's the difference for me, understanding the distribution. I mean, they're very complimentary. Uh, Peter, I can comment in a second, but to me, the thing that would lean most strongly towards using this device would be longer length and more severe luminal stenosis because you know you could deliver shockwave, but you're going to have guide extensions down, you're going to have extremis times, you're going to use multiple balloons, and it becomes prohibitive. So for me, if I see a long length of calcium um, and it's severe to cross, then this is a much faster way of doing it. That old phenomenon of rota regret where you regretted putting in atherectomy still exists. Peter? Yeah, and I think also, you know, sometimes it smooths, it smooths it out. So, you know, some you can get uh, burst balloons, you know, if, you, if you've got craggy kind of calcium. So I think some form of atherectomy in some cases is really beneficial because it just makes the rest of the case so much easier. Yeah, and final question was on bailout strategy for a stuck device. It just doesn't, I mean, I've had one stuck and it just came out like that. And uh, most of the times it, it does not happen. Um, it, it actually will shut off on its own. And, but it's generally something that's pretty straightforward. I don't know if this, you've, in, in, you've experienced this. Yeah, never had, fortunately, never had sure. that uh, situation. Good. So, uh, well, so I have put together a few um, key learnings for the session. Uh, I think the, the cases that you have shown, guys, are demonstrating that orbital therectomy is a versatile tool for, for plaque preparation. I think that we've seen it in different scenarios. Um, certainly, the dual mechanism of action is really important. I think this is a great contribution in the, in, 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 in the way that we treat uh, calcific plaque. And I think that the more options we have on the table, the better, because these patients can be very challenging. And, um, and, and we've seen also the, the use of synergic use of orbital atherectomy and other plaque preparation tools. And this is something that, again, we were just discussing now at the end of the session. Uh, well, with this, uh, AJ, probably we came to the end of the session. Uh, let's first of all thank to all the audience uh, that have been with us in Paris, also to the audience, the colleagues that are um, online attending the session. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, Evald, Peter, for preparing the cases, for sharing with us uh, your experience. And uh, well, it's, uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the session and we wish you a very nice evening in Paris. Thank you. Thank you.